Well, a wonderful good evening, einen wunderschönen guten Abend. We're going to have this discussion in English, so I will also do the introduction in English. First of all, a very warm welcome on behalf of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung South African Office, <laughs> because we are here on a mission. Uh, my, name is, uh, my name is Jan, I'm the regional director of the RLS in Johannesburg, and we are having a little bit of an experiment, because this is the first for us, it's the first time that we are here in this space, and it's the first time that we as RLS engage in some sort of dialogue discussion regarding the queer community in South Africa and in Berlin. To give you a little bit of a background, introduce the podium before I then go to the back, I just want to say that we've been working in South Africa for 13 years now on a number of social justice-related activities. And one of the main focuses were also working with the LGBT community and strengthening the capacity of LGBT organization in the whole Southern African region. And we came across, and or actually I, have, I also came across in the last year since I've been living there, a very fascinating and unique situation, where in other spaces, um, the gay community is at the vanguard of being of integrating, of being integrated in society, we see that in the South African context, it's actually a representation of the segregation of the disparities that are so um, representative of South Africa, which is race, class, and space. And race, class, and space are represented within the gay community and even within the, uh, what we could call the gay body. So we discovered or we found out that actually the only community that tries to transcend these lines that go back, way back in the history of apartheid are people, artists, culture, just or, or isolated persons who identify themselves as queer. So we were trying to opening up and setting up dialogues with people who work on queer projects in South Africa. And this is the first outcome we have four guests here, who are, three of them are going to perform later at a, I think, what's going to be an amazing concert, but since we are lefties, we always have to have some sort of discussion before. Um, and you are, and a monologue, that's me. Um, but I, I'm going to cut it short. We, ha we, are, we have here the representatives of Stash Crew, which, uh, which are by, by Thea, Joni, and Kyle, and who on a who are mu musical artists who are going to perform later at the show. But we also wanted to have a different form of representation of what is supposed to be queer art. So we also have Kieran here, who is a performing artist and choreographer. They're going to speak about the experience. And they are here for a week. So those of you who are trying, who are, will also visit your city on the festival, will let's see some of them at this weekend in Berlin. With this, I also want to welcome my wonderful colleague, Johanna, from the European Department, who is working on LGBT issues all across, also Central and Eastern Europe. Yeah, we're going to have a short discussion now on the question of what it means to be queer in the modern South African context. We invite you to contribute. This is for me, the German term would be Werkstattgespräch, or la like a form of laboratory where we invite you to contribute, to put questions. After that, we're going to have a short break, and then we're going to have massive fun with the concert. And with this, yeah, I just hand over to you. And again, thank you for coming. And we really appreciate that you're here on this summer day in Berlin. <laughs> and um, yeah, we, we, we hope you're going to have an amazing experience. And we are also excited to learn from you in this context. Again, a very warm welcome. OK. Thank you, Jan Jan. So I guess everybody knows that there are drinks at the bar, so feel free to go. Um, also, very many thanks to the team of the Südblock and the Aquarium. When I was a child, I used to go here to buy fishes for my aquarium. Now the aquarium is outside, so it's like, uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, um, since we, we called this, um, this little Werkstattgespräch, how uh, Jan Jan said, um, being queer in South Africa, I think, most of you know that uh, South Africa is one of the countries in the world and in Africa which is having like a legal framework with, which is supposed to be very queer friendly, but we all know that the reality is like very different. And I would invite you to just 
share your experience of being queer and you, like how you work in your art spaces and where like the divisions are because as we all learned from you and since uh, we work since a long time as Rosa Luxemburg Foundation there are like a lot of borders and divisions between class, gender, queer people, not queer people, poor people and that we try to understand a little bit more how the situation is. Who wants to start? Um, my name is Umli Lo, um, and I'm an avant-garde musical artist, um, performance artist. And I think I first sort of understood the term queer um, when I was in university. I think growing up um, in South Africa, in a sort of queer body, there was not a lot of vocabulary um, to, to sort of describe who you were besides like gay, lesbian, I mean, even um, trance wasn't something that was in the lexicon when we were growing up. But um, South Africa has a very um, progressive uh, constitution. And I think we are the products of, um, you know, our four fathers and daughters who fought um, for the queer rights to also be part of our constitution in 1994 when it became a democracy. Um, so I think that also informed a lot of um, how I grew up because there was the sense of something changing, there was a little bit more sort of literature, there was a little bit more sort of representation um, in a very small way. Um, but I remember when I was 16 and really grappling with um, my identity and trying to figure out who I was, I had to reach out to, you know, again, lesbian organizations and magazines to send me information. I mean, I was a nerd like that. but. Um, <laughs> That, that really helped because you, you felt like there was nobody else in the world who is like you. Mm -hmm. And that helped me sort of start reaching out to a larger community. And then when I got a little bit older, um, I felt like the labels that I had sort of identified with, like maybe gay, um, were not enough um, or all encompassing of, of who I was, of the sort of full spectrum um, of the person that I was, gender wise, identity wise. And one thing that I've always had to sort of grapple with is being, you know, a black South African queer person and what that means and which one comes first. You know, a lot of people will ask you in terms of identity politics, you know, which one is more important to you, your, your black or queer body, it all lives in me. So I had to sort of discover that as well. Um, but I think I'm very lucky as an artist, um, I got to sort of explore that as well. So bringing people onto this journey that is a continuous sort of search for identity and investigation of my identity is very much in my work and it's very much something that I, a conversation that I like to have through art, through performance, through music. Um, and yeah, that sort of is me in a nutshell in terms of um, a queer identity. Mm. Yeah. Could I speak in here? Hello. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Kiron, uh, Kiron Gina, and I'm a performance artist as well as an art educator, and I play around with all kinds of mediums. Um, I also am the founder and curator of Queer Night South Africa, and it initiated last year, and purely based on Yo Sisi Yo Festival, where I had the opportunity and the privilege of experiencing all the different kinds of arts that's explored amongst the queer community here in Berlin, as well as um, internationally. And I felt like we need something like that that's going to bring people together in South Africa, um, particularly in Johannesburg, where there's a cosmopolitan exchange of diversity that's slowly starting to breathe through the city. Um, so I come from Durban originally, and I moved very young with my mom in chase of gold and dreams because Johannesburg is the city of gold. And living with a single parent um, kind of taught me a very feminine way of, of and, and pre presentation of my body. And that for me was really, um, I think, all-encompassing, inclusive from my parents' side like not having this kind of 
restrictive parent who said, no, you're, you're cast out of the family was really important. And for me, growing up at university, well, growing up and then reaching university, I kind of felt bottled by the racial divide and the segregation act of the apartheid regime. And being bought, like going through 1994 and standing with my mom in a queue, and she said, this is going to be the biggest day of our lives. Um, and, and me as a child asking, please could I have a cool drink rather, um, <laughs> was really tough for her to, but later realizing like that I could start potentially going to a, a better school and developing my education and then reaching university was like an all time favorite for her because she kind of sacrificed her life in order for me to be at university by moving to Johannesburg and like working her ass off basically. Um, and I guess like at university I was exposed to gender and sexuality and like how people were starting to call themselves or present themselves, you know, and it was symbolic for me because it became an exchange and a conversation between myself and the people that I was meeting at university, which then gave me a voice to kind of let go of kind of this oppressive feeling of being bottled and like you can't be gay, you can't, also this term queer was not um, in my vocabulary at the time. And only at university did I start feeling like, ah, oh, it's an identity I can adopt, that I feel othered, so I, I want to be appreciated by others who feel othered. And I guess this kind of broke down boundaries amongst the peers that I was meeting and friends, and the friendships that I, I started to garner were much more, were, were less about race and a class, they were more about inclusivity around the same objectives and the idea of working together um, towards a stronger, acceptable future for not only like myself but also for the youth. And I think um, going into Queer Night South Africa, uh, it, it gave me an opportunity to offer young people um, a platform to have conversations and, and to discuss the kinds of topics that were not necessarily face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, you know, because all these conversations kind of happened in closed doors about race and politics and ah. Uh, and then in these spaces, it was all encompassed around love and inclusivity and by sharing that w through art. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, hi, my name is Joni. Um, I perform as Missy Firefly in Stash Crew. Um, I am also an a interdis interdisciplinary artist with a background in choreography, firstly, and dance, and then theatre making, and now eventually music, um, which I find is maybe a more accessible kind of genre of the three. Um, uh, with, with regards to the question and the term queer, I'm, I think I can agree with my chomis here, with my friends, that you know the first time I kind of came across the word was also at university when we started engaging with kind of queer theory. It's all very exciting. Um, and I found that I am drawn more to this term within a South African society because, because it is more inclusive and because it, it's much more playful. Um, I found that when I kind of... Well, I didn't really come out because I think there's also like a huge problem with that narrative of coming out. My sister just told everybody that, you know, <laughs> that I was into girls. But I think when I started engaging with people, with the more kind of, um, let's say, lesbian and gay community within the South African context, it was extremely... Um, Oh, what is the word I'm looking for? I find sometimes those contexts to also be extremely repressed. So it's almost like those, some of those communities have taken a very heteronormative paradigm and just replicated it into their own, their own world. So it was very much about like what roles you have to play, butchies can only be with femmes. Like, you know, it was kind of like really like rigid and you had to kind of subscribe again to have to subscribe again to a certain role um, that we were kind of running away from in terms of in terms of this kind of dominating white heteronormative narrative um, and so again I found kind of 
the term queer to be more inclusive and then, um, yeah, more colorful. So the queer community that we are kind of engaged with in Johannesburg is much more diverse, um, is kind of crossing cross-cultural, cross-cultural and cross-class and cross-race, um, which I think is, is really important. Um, and, and just more exciting and much softer than kind of your gay, gay and lesbian spaces. Cool, hello. <clears throat> uh, my name is White Lion. Um, yeah, I think, I think for me it might be a, a good idea to kind of start uh, the conversation from my part with uh, an explanation for the name because this, the, I think the story is quite interesting. Um, so we've kind of spoken a little bit about how in South Africa there's a, a real segregation of space um, and it's, it's quite tangible uh, through the Group Areas Act. Uh, people were very much separated according to race and, and, and now that kind of translates as well into classism as well. Um, and for me, my, my kind of pseudonym came along because when I first moved to Johannesburg, um, I would take uh, taxis. So in Johannesburg, we have minibus taxis, which is a very f a f a cheap form of transport um, and largely predominantly used by uh, the black population in South Africa um, and by the, the working class people of South Africa. And it's, it's quite unusual to see a white person uh, on these taxis. So um, I used to take them a lot because I don't have a driver's license and uh, I couldn't afford a car. So uh, I uh, would take these taxis a lot and my one friend, Makhosi, uh, called me the white lion because white lions are rare and uh, uh, white lions are brave because there's this, this kind of perception that, you know, it's a dangerous form of transport to take. Um, so that's, that's kind of where my, uh, my identity as white lion uh, really started. Um, I had quite an unusual upbringing. Uh, my, my family moved into one of the previous homelands uh, in South Africa called Gazankulu uh, before the change took place. Uh, and we lived in a little white spot within the black spot uh, for a while before uh, the end of apartheid. Um, and I was one of six uh, white kids at my school, which again is, is quite an unusual experience for white people in uh, white kids in South Africa. Uh, a lot of, of, of white kids still go to very bourgeois uh, private schools, um, and, and there's a lot of segregation that still happens uh, spatially. Um, and so, yeah, when I, when I again, very similar to everybody else, um, I, I find that a lot of the, the uh, stereotypical gay and lesbian spaces in South Africa, um, and in particular in, in our context, I feel that there's a very um, white gay narrative um, that's incredibly hyper-masculine um, and is almost mirror, mirroring the hyper-masculine uh, context which we come from. Um, and it's something that's been quite tangible for me here, uh, noticing how hyper-masculine our space is um, and how, how damaging that is and, and how it feeds into a lot of um, further repression, further segregation. Um, and so when Stash Crew first started, we, we dealt a lot with um, whiteness, deconstruction of whiteness, of white identity, uh, which is something that actually doesn't happen quite often in South Africa because there's a sense of... Um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of the white population uh, avoid deconstructing, deconstructing what it means to be white and how that relates uh, within the, in the context. So, uh, yeah, a lot of our work started doing that. Um, and then we, we also started uh, looking at, you know, how that was linked to our queer identity. Um, and, and, and that queerness became a way to, again, encompass uh, explorations around our gender, ex explorations around our sexuality, uh, explorations around our race, and, and it became more intersectional as opposed to uh, just having this, yeah, this one defined box that was almost trying to replicate uh, a very heteronormative paradigm in, in, in relations. Okay, thanks. All you guys are so great, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, so. um, just one more question, because I guess, you know, all of you have like a lot of more questions and we don't have that much time because we want to see you um, performing. That's um, what we are so excited about. Um, I would be interested a little bit more like about um, the way, as you, I, I said, I guess you said that when we talked before, as how you use your art as a vehicle for progressive queer politics and uh, where you see also that we could like how you know like the queer communities could work together and where there is the potential and 
also the, um, if that is related to the discourse and also the movement of decolonization, which is like going on now in South Africa are very strong from Africa, which is of course something we have to adopt in Europe a lot because it's something which will bind us for a long time to do that struggle together. You want to start? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think all of us um, sitting here have been very lucky to have a space and people that you can share ideas and um, really come together. And I think it's through that that, I mean, I've found growth as an artist through finding other queer artists. When I started out, I was in Cape Town, which um, is in the coast in South Africa, and it's quite a, the Eurocentric city in, um, in South Africa. So it's very much um, a very sort of white, um, whiteness is very much applauded in that city, you know, and so an artist like me coming out and being, you know, queer and, you know, singing and rapping and like, you know, people couldn't box me and it became a, a quite a, an, an issue of like, how do we, where do you perform, where do you find spaces, who comes to your performances, who engages in what you're talking about. And I think the internet for me became the sort of that, um, space where not only um, was I sort of talking to people all over the world who were sort of responding to the stuff that I was putting out either on YouTube or um, just on social media, um, that sort of started the conversation for me. That's where it really began was the coming together of the internet and I think in South Africa it's quite an important context because the internet has brought people together in many ways. Um, you know, even something like Black Twitter um, in South Africa is one of the first places I would go to to find news and how people are responding to current political situations. So that space has become a quite an important space to start the conversation. And I think it's um, one of those things that has now sort of brought us here where we're having a more international conversation around um, race, around gender, around decolonization. Um, because also working in isolation is, is is not great and it's through that, it's through engaging with people in other countries like what is your experience um, as a refugee living in Europe or what is your experience um, as a non-binary person living in a Trump era state, you know. So I think those conversations always feed into um, the, gen the general sort of um, larger conversation that um, queer people are having all over the world. I think a lot of people are deconstructing um, our histories and we de deconstructing ourselves and our identities and finding new identity. Um, and I think, yeah, the internet is a huge part of making that happen because you're no longer stuck in, you know, some faraway land with no one else to talk to about these issues. So the conversation keeps going. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just going to say that as well, is that like visibility is such an important aspect of it as well. So when we were growing up, we had, there was no visibility, there was no, let alone, I mean, you know, queerness as a term is, is quite a, a new term in our context, I think. Um, and and for me, I only started really engaging with the gay narrative when I, when I was at university. Um, so I think, yeah, I think visibility is really important, uh, finding ways in which we can have conversations with queers all over the world, uh, something we did earlier this year when uh, we, we managed to travel to uh, Brazil for two weeks and did some shows there and engaged there as well. And um, we did some workshops around uh, queer identity and expression. And the things that came out of that, the connections that came out of people sharing their stories uh, and people sharing their art form as well was just incredible. Um, so I think, yeah, it's visibility and, and the ability to, to have conversations that just haven't happened before. For me, it's about accessibility um, because uh, pre-94, we were segregated according to our races and um, those, uh, there hasn't been a bridge that has kind of um, brought us all together in terms of transportation. I'm being very practical now. And accessibility amongst 
us, we're, we're kind of privileged because we can jump in a taxi, we can jump in a car and we can meet one another and we can have these conversations and kikis and really talk about the nitty gritty that's affecting us as a queer community and also how we're going to stabilize ourselves in creating work that's for our people, that's also uh, questioning the kinds of constructs that we're living um, or the structures that we're living in. And for me, it's also about um, kind of finding a way to um, link it to education. So having workshops with young people is a, is, a, is a means to, is a vehicle of translating our narratives and listening to indigenous narratives as well. Because for a lot, a lot of the time, we are saturated with this kind of urban um, internet generation and we're not listening to indigenous people from that line, like the Khoisan, who are the originals of South Africa, if we look back at the history. And I guess like also those narratives of queer identity were always there and to share amongst ourselves uh, geographically around, uh, across South Africa, that's a very important thing. So like festivals, um, arts festivals and uh, spaces where we can meet and, and have conversations around um, our identity and sexuality have become uh, crucial. And I think for us to bridge a gap, and there's currently a big gap, and the reason why we are initiating um, these collectives and arts projects, in particularly in Johannesburg, which is like a big hub, is because then slowly it'll have an outreach um, to younger people, and particularly uh, communities that are still ostracized or oppressed in a way, because as much as we look like, wow, they look so colorful and from South Africa, it's still a very oppressed space and that the dialogue is not necessarily there because people don't have the accessibility, as I said earlier, uh, to books, to general conversations. And for me, I think uh, what we're trying to do in Johannesburg right now is trying to build a network and, and that also builds a network with an international grounding with like people from America who come in and they're like, we'd really like to do some work in Johannesburg with you guys. And then we travel to Cape Town. Like for example, Sia and I did a project in Cape Town in December called Hashtag Femme in Public, where we did a basic procession dressed ourselves as, as beautifully as possible and took it to the streets. Um, a collective of us of approximately eight to 10 people of color um, just basically wanted to express ourselves and not feel like we would be beaten for expressing the colorful or the, the, <clears throat> the way we want to dress our bodies. And it, <clears throat> it, it, it challenged us as well because the conversations amongst us as peers, like having these like racial binaries, it really gave us a moment to really meet one another and say like, this is not a fight between us. It's a, really a fight with the system and a structure that we've been trying to revolt against for the longest time. And if we can collectively stand together and find a way by using art or the vehicle of media to translate our narratives, this is going to be the thing that's going to carry us across. Um, and, it, it, and it does become dire because we have a, collect, a correctional rape where particularly black female lesbians are being raped in townships. And this is a real bi a big problem in South Africa, it's you like know? It's epidemic, actually. Yeah. It's, it's psychological yeah. and it really affects us, especially like having black female friends who are lesbian and then they get beaten in club bathrooms, for example, because it's a very dominant, white, masculine space that's considered gay. And then like, you know, there's all of these real issues. And I think for me as a performance artist, I'm currently working in an international collaboration um, with three lesbian females, two from South Africa and one from Germany, but she lives in Basel. And the show is called Pink Dollar, and it deals with the currencies that are working within the queer community, and particularly money that's coming from Europe and how it is affecting us in South Africa, whether it is bridging, uh, like building more of a gap between us or actually building us together is the big question that we're kind of dealing with in the research of it, you know? So for me, it's about using these, uh, these topics and these ideas as subject material to address our audiences 
and cultivate conversations, not only in like, wow, it looks so beautiful, but afterwards, you know? It would be really interesting to hear conversations on your side, what you think of South Africa, as opposed to what we think, what, you, what we think you think of us, you know, all the time. Yeah. yeah. Do you wanna? Cool, yes, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, sure, of course. Um, I think for me, again, is to kind of drive, to to drive this kind of um, approach of playfulness into the narrative because all of us here are kind of interested in activism, but I've, I've also found activism in some spaces in Johannesburg to be very dull and and quite serious, you know, and quite, um, quite oppressive also in a way. Um, and so we kind of are using our art form to ask, to be provocative, definitely, um, to provoke and to ask some very difficult questions, but in an accessible way. Um, and I think that's really important in terms of starting conversations and to, for us to also, in our own kind of research, understand that we, like, we also don't have any answers. You know, like, what is queer? Well, today I feel like wearing this. Um, you know, like, it's that the, the conversation keeps going and that we're able to create spaces within our own art practices and within our own friendships um, where we can have these conversations and where we can invite people um, instead of pointing fingers at people to question their own ideologies, to question their own perceptions, to question their own kind of ingrained bigotry that you don't know where it comes from, you know, from your parents or from, you know, living in a military zone in Johannesburg during apartheid. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's, that's why we kind of make music and dress up so nicely for everyone tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm. We can't wait to, to hear that and, and see, see your dresses moving around in the space. Um, now we have some time for questions. I don't know, Britta, how we exactly do it. Do we take that microphone? Yeah? And we tried, we're gonna work with them. We're gonna make that happen. I saw somebody having a question there. And another one. Hello. <clears throat> I just, uh, I'm just asking this question you mentioned uh, right before that what is queer? Because if you say that you don't like the term gay or lesbian, that you say the term gay is masculinity and, and white. And European, what is uh, what is queer? What makes it better, and how do you define it? Not just as non-gay, but what is like how positively you define do you define queer? Um, yeah. 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 Um, so I think what I think what we're saying is is that there's 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 a lot of value in in identifying as as gay and and, and lesbian, um, and, but I think what's happened in our context in particular. Uh, is that it's 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 dominated because of resources and because of space. Um, it's dominated by a gay white uh, narrative that's incredibly hyper masculine in our particular context. Um, and so I think what we we're saying is that the term queer for us uh, who don't identify with with that that particular um, train of thought was that it's it became somewhere where we could explore multiple aspects of our identity as opposed to just our sexual identity. So it became somewhere where we could not. Only only explore our sexual identity, but also our gender identity, also our, our race, our racial identity and our, our race relations, also our um, economic uh, identity as well. So that the, the term queer for us is, is very inclusive. Um, and I think that's also kind of trying to work against binary, binary uh, ways of thinking and, and binary models of thought. Um, and, and that's very important and valuable in our context. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you all on the podium for sharing your stories. It was really um, enlightening and very touching, actually. But I have two critical questions, and one maybe concerns the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. You talked so much about class, and yet all the people on the podium are so articulate and from their university background that you all sort of um, also highlighted in your own speeches and the, you know, 
knowing and the knowledge of queerness, I'm wondering actually where the class background, where the relation to the working class, the queer working class in South Africa actually is on this podium, what the relation is. That is not an attack to the people on the podium, but maybe like an open question or a critical question to you. Just like, you know, it seems like a very elitist podium, um, you know, in a good sense. The other question concerns you, White Lion. Also, your question, I might have misunderstood it, but um, it was I, I was irritated by um, your explanation of you being a white person in a working class, black sort of like commute uh, community. Um, and that sort of like was a term given to you that sort of like puts you above maybe or like puts you into, and maybe you could cl um, clarify that on that a little bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a, a term that was uh, or a name that was given to me by, by my, one of my uh, black female friends who I used to take a taxi with a lot, and it it is kind of a said in jest. You know, I, I think the name White Lion is also is, is kind of ambiguous. You know, so white person lying, um, and a deconstruction of, of the white lies themselves. So whilst it's so whilst it's it's for me it was more that uh, it's it, it deals with the absurdity of that. The absurdity that we even highlight the fact that it's it's unusual for a white person to take a taxi in our context that to me is absolutely absurd, um, especially when 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 it's it's probably the most accessible form of transport in our country. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the the name to me highlights the absurdity um, of 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 our context and of our of our situation. I'd just like to respond to your first question because I think, you know, it's something that um, mm. I personally grapple with a lot and in our context in South Africa, class has become quite a, a major issue um, in our country because um, our inequality gap has gone wider and wider. And just to give you a little bit of a context of where I've come from, and it's really ironic when you have to answer these kind of questions because I remember my family when I was very young, and my mom was a single mom, um, working class background, we lived in the townships, I actually lived with my grandmother. So that's sort of the structure that happens um, usually in South Africa, the parents would go work in the city, and then you stay with your grandparents um, in the township, and that was sort of my background. And you know, my family worked really hard to get me into these Model C schools that were previously very white, um, but with the turn of democracy had actually become quite mixed. So I got lucky that I was in schools that were, you know, government schools, but they were really good. And there was this huge thing of education because my parents didn't get to go to university. Um, mm -hmm. I became one of the first people to graduate from university. Um, and it's really interesting when you, you, so, you know, sort of, you can judge a book by its cover when they're sitting on the panel and you're all dressed up. Um, and you don't know somebody's context. Yeah, most of us have to do multiple jobs with our art as well in order to survive. You know, so the class thing is a constant issue um, in terms of what we deal with within our art. Um, I'm a musician and I'd love to do music full time, but I have to take time off my other jobs um, in order to do this. You know, I don't dress up like this every single day. I have to put my hair down, put it back, and you know, be a working class person and get into a taxi every single day and be an everyday South African. And I think that's what makes our context so different with this panel is that we are the bridges because we exist in so many different worlds. I can take a taxi and be in the township and be harassed and then the next day I'm in Berlin um, sitting in front of a panel. So like that dichotomy for me is also something that I struggle with because I get home and I don't have money in my bank account and you know my Instagram is blowing up and everyone's like oh you're traveling you're living the life and you're like look at my fridge like it's really bad you know and it, it, I think it's 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 quite indicative of like what we were promised I think I mean I can speak for myself and say I am an angry black queer person because I was sold the dream. I was told if I speak English a certain way, if I sing a certain way, if I dress up a certain way, I would have all these rewards. And I'm still asking myself, where are all of these rewards? You know, I probably will never be able to buy property for my mom. Um, she will probably always end up living with my grandmother. You know, all of those situations are part of my story and part of the things that, you know, do make me an angry person because I'm like, 
how, why is why is everything so dichotomous and why um, why does it feel like you're never really winning? So we focus on the little things that we do have control over. Um, I just wanted to. Yeah. Do you want to add something? No, I, I, I just, in just regards to the first question. I think. Um, <clears throat> The fact that we do come, uh, we look like we have, um, we've come from a very like uh, privileged background is not the case when you really dig deeper into our narratives. And I think, um, as Sia has mentioned, like being a person of color in South Africa and being on this stage, like this is a dream actually. So we're sitting here like, thinking of dreams that we would have had and we're here and going back to South Africa, we still have to be with uh, dealing with the shit that we have to deal with every day. And I use this term because like there's still these promised uh, promises that are coming from our current government, which we're not addressing. And like, we still have to go and, and like kind of sell this, the, this kind of, there's hope for us still. And is there really hope is the biggest question we all have right now, you know? Should I say something from the point of Rosa Luxemburg <laughs> Foundation? I mean, I, mean um, I think the most important uh, things, which, which I would say they are like, we are in the same position. So, oh, I mean, as a foundation, we have money and we could contribute and we try to support people everywhere. And it's for, since we are allowed, since the term class is a little bit back on stage because we had a long period in Europe where the social democrats just said like, okay, we are like, every, everybody's in the middle and which is of course not true and it's like the, the term class and that we define each other um, like that and have a look on it is back a little bit. And we focus on that as well. Of course, we try to do a lot of work. So I'm the head of the European department. And if I'm thinking about about the year I had, the last year where I was traveling, I had so many very touching conversations with LGBTI people in Kriva Rock, which is like in the southwest of Ukraine, you know, where the people are really like like it's the end of Europe, really working class, suffering from the war, which is taking place next. We have like queer, fe we are the founders of the, or we fund like a lot of the queer festival in Novo Zibirsk, for example. So we of course try to do something, but it's always like very tiny and very little. And of course you are right, it's very often that those who can travel, who can speak different languages, who know how to express themselves, are the one ones which are more visible. But of course we try to open that up and I have to say I'm very touched by seeing that and one of the reasons why we focus a lot on LGBTI issues in all those situations, in war situations, in, and when we work like in very poor countries is because there is so much potential. And I think this is what, what um, because there, there are those vehicles in arts, but also in the social movement. And um, so we always try to, to move it a little bit to the, to the positive, um, like try to see it a little bit posi positive, but of course we cannot change that situation immediately. Yeah. But I'm, I have to say, if I see, like I'm traveling in Europe all the time and Jan Jan could tell much more about South Africa, we see so many things like burgeoning, like growing a little bit. That I'm that I'm positive that we that we can use um, that we also can use the LGBTI movements for the progressive left wing politics, which are critical about the class question as well, and that it's probably easier than doing it somewhere else. I was also going to say that I think again it's 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 very contextual. Like it's important to to remember that in our context, the class struggle is very much connected to the race struggle, um, and it's very much connected to white privilege. What access? What behavior? What grants you access to privilege in our context? And in for the most part, it's white privilege, whiteness. Whiteness is access to resources in our context. Whiteness is access to power. Whiteness is access to education. It's access to space. And so it's, it's important to remember that our class struggle is very much connected to the racial relations in our country. Um, and also that that's not, a, that's, not, that's not an apartheid narrative. That's a colonial narrative. 
Yeah, so that's historic. That's like hundreds and thousands of years of, of, a, of European oppression um, against Africa. So yeah, I think it's good, it's good to, to keep context in mind when, when dealing with those questions. I mean, a perfect example is that South Africa's predominant language is Zulu, and you will probably not find very many signs in Zulu. You can get by speaking English. All the signs are in English and Afrikaans. It's a white space for the, for the most part in terms of the signs and the semiotics that are in place there. Um, it's, it, it doesn't, it, it is not, it's not a space that is, is friendly towards the majority of the populace. Okay, we have time like for, yeah, Britta, could you come for one or two more rounds? Well, I'm not sure whether I'm able to form the question I want to ask, but anyway, I'll try. I would be interested in the connection between uh, homophobia and the decolonization process uh, in the white communities and in black or Indian or whatsoever communities, I think there should be different connections between, uh, uh, yeah, okay. D can you make anything of that question? Yeah. Who, yeah? Um, I mean, I'll just, it's something that we talk about a lot actually because in South Africa, for example, um, our context is very informed by colonization and then apartheid. So there's this sort of historical thing. And like homophobia is something that, you know, we, a lot of us are convinced that it was something that was brought in with colonization. Um, us being clothed, you know, people being taken out of their context, their, their traditional context and religion as well. So we're fighting so many different fights that have made people the way they are. I mean, in countries like Uganda, you have American evangelists bringing homophobia to people via the word of God, the Bible. And a country that never really thought of homophobia or homosexuals or anything, all of a sudden it becomes the main rhetoric in their politics, it becomes a rhetoric in churches, and that's how the word sort of spreads, that these kind of people should be um, discriminated against. So we're dealing with a lot of legacy problems, I think, um, with homophobia, but even something like corrective rape can be directly linked to migration can be directly linked to colonization and like the idea of the black man is like just a labor force and um, and to all the resources that were spent sort of building Europe and other parts of the world um, was sort of stolen have stolen progress in places like South Africa and in a lot of African countries so it's very difficult to not to deal with them in different contexts because they're so interlinked. And part of that is understanding what is the new Africa, like something like Afrofuturism is about like inclusivity and looking back at your own traditional African identity and seeing where did the homophobia come in because we didn't have the vocabulary for even something like homophobia, you know? And I think a lot of um, people with an indigenous sort of link um, I mean, I know for myself personally is, is an investigation that I've had to look at within my own home language and my own um, sort of traditional um, home life of um, I am Zulu and the Zulus are po possibly part of a very homophobic group that is very driven by a, a hyper-masculine drive. Um, but I don't think it was always that way because you've got beautiful literature of people like Shaka Zulu, who, you know, a lot of people had recorded having um, sort of homosexual relationships and all of that. So it's also part of like our literature was stolen from us and we're trying to put the pieces back and trying to understand where, where it all went wrong and how do we fix it for the future. That was a nearly a perfect last word. <laughs> but is there anybody else with something important you want to ask? No, then I, it's not time to say thank you because I think the bigger part 
is still coming, but it was so good to um, to talk to you before and learn about your lives and the struggles and the fights. And I we also got like more notion, you know, how we could interact, uh, I guess, and go on. And so we have a five minute break. Um, everybody can run to the bar, get more drinks. And um, there will be just a little bit of uh, re movement here, but it will not take long. And uh, we hope that everybody is um, being here for the show. And thank you. Thank you.